Um, so now we're ready for our first keynote of the day. Let me just say one thing before I, I, Dr. Cindy Nixon introduces our keynote. I, I just want to remind you that we're going to close out the day back in here with our panel discussion. And I did not put a slide in there to remind me to say that. So, so don't forget that after lunch, we'll come in here for our closing. So I would like to introduce to you Dr. Cindy Nixon. She is such an important part of the Center of Excellence. And uh, she's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Cindy. Good morning. Good morning. I do want to say one thing about the scavenger hunt. There are two people here that are that were born in West Virginia. So some of you seem to think that's a very elusive question, but uh, there are two people here. So uh, with that said, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Horace R. Hall. Um, he received his doctorate from the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois in Chicago, excuse me, and is currently an associate professor at DePaul University, um, also in Chicago, in the Department of Educational Policy Studies and Research. Um, he teaches undergraduate and graduate level courses in the area of human development and growth, um, historical and contemporary issues in education, as well as the philosophy and psychology of adolescence. Dr. Hall is the author of such books as Mentoring Young Men of Color, Meeting the Needs of African American and Latina Males, um, Understanding Teenage Girls, Culture, Identity, and Schooling, and he also has a forthcoming book um, edited volume titled Uprooting Urban America, Multidisciplinary Perspectives on Race, Class, and Gentrification. Dr. Hall has taught for several years in Chicago's public school system and later co-founded a youth activist program titled Real, Respect, Excellence, Attitude, and Leadership. Since 2000, Real has collaborated with the Chicago Public Schools um, and their students in developing and implementing change-based efforts within their schools and community. And I also want to add that um, Dr. Hall gets lots of kudos for being here because when I picked him up at 6.20 this morning, I learned that his flight out of Charlotte had been canceled. And if any of you fly in and out of Florence to Charlotte, you know what I'm talking about. And so he had to rent a car um, to get down here and arrive later uh, than expected last evening, and I had him up early this morning to pick him up at 6.20. So please welcome, and I'm honored to have with us Dr. Horace Hall. Cindy Nixon, uh, Marky B. I love the name Marky B. I meant to tell you that. I just want to name my daughter Marky B. Um, and Brenda Hill for inviting me out. And Darlene Unger, who's an old colleague of mine from DePaul University, for inviting me down to, uh, to Florence, South Carolina, for this event. Uh, very well organized event. Let's give it up. Really quick about the airport. Um, that was just so wrong. <laughs> delay, delay, cancel. And I think, of, how am I going to get out? How do I get to Florence? <laughs> you know, so the, 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 the agent asked me, do you want to go to uh, Myrtle Beach? I was like, what's Myrtle Beach? Said, oh, you would love Myrtle Beach. I was like, I've got to go do work. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it was, it, was, it was a good drive, and I'm just, I'm really happy to be here. By the grace of God, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I didn't have to make it, so uh, I'm happy about that. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, we first started out, I mean, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I didn't get into 11.30, but 7 o'clock in the morning, I said, that's the blessing of that is that it's cooler in the, in, in the early morning hours, because apparently it's going to get really, really hot today. <laughs> So I'm glad that uh, we're doing this early, and um, 
And thank you all for coming out. So I'm going to show, uh, this is the first video I'm going to show. I'm going to show different videos throughout the presentation. Um, when I was asked to come and, and do Reel, typically when, when I've done uh, presentations on Reel in places like Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, New York, I'm able to take the young people to the program and some of the mentors with me. Uh, because the program is, is not really about me, it's about the young people. So the videos that I'm showing uh, is really them here with me in many respects. And I think it also gives you a better sense uh, and more words than I can say and express about the program. Real is a Chicago-based, youth-centered program designed to assist children and adolescents in developing critical thinking and effective communication skills needed for lifelong learning and success both in and out of school. Real understands the importance of helping young people find a voice and perceiving themselves, as well as others, as fully human, with an innate ability to be viable change agents in their respective communities and in their own lives. The real programs means to strengthen your ability to do anything you want to do. Uh, the real program to me means uh, gives you a, a chance or like an opportunity just to show everybody like what you can do, like your talents, your skills, to show everybody. Because right now we're having like a big program, so just show everybody like what you do, basically. Youth empowerment. Um, the real program to me means that I can come to like a place where I can be me and be myself and show you how show like, like real I am and a chance to get to know like people that I chill with and to know them better and a place where I can just, I can just be. The real program means being able to express yourself, being able to have someone see your other side of you, some, something that's real about you, something where you can let other people see your talent. Being able to be real with yourself, it's, it's a respect thing. The real program to me means an opportunity to actually do something to try to help young people. Instead of sitting around wondering or thinking how overwhelming the whole, pro the, the whole problem of youth is today and feeling overwhelmed and not knowing what to do, real offers me an opportunity to actually do what I can do instead of focusing on everything I can't do. And working with youth is the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. Um, to me, the real program means you know, a, a spot where you, know, you can do what you want to do, present your creation to people who are actually paying attention and want to see what you want to make. So that's why I believe the real program means to me. I was getting my chance to show my talent and all that other good stuff. Real is about reflection, reformulation, and restructuring your life as you see fit. Real program means to me uh, respect, um, leadership, and attitude. And I hold that against me, you know to carry on with my lifetime, you know, and um, it's a very nice program, and that's what, that's what it pretty much means to me, you know, real program. The real program to me is the facilitation of a space where our youth can come together and to think critically about what it is that they're facing, the most pressing issues that they're facing, they get to name them, they get to confront them, and then they, they get to put together some action steps to say, this is what we're gonna do, como una comunidad. And that's really what the message of real is, and, and what we try to do here is to create that space para que la juventud puedan hablar de los asuntos que están afectando las comunidades en que viven. And to be a part of that has just really been an honor and a privilege. And I've spent 15 years in school, and I think that I'm just learning how to think critically because of these youth. It ain't nothing but how kids communicate with each other. It shows, it shows a better understanding of how young people in a community are supposed to be and what they should do to have the community be a better place.
The RIP program means adults working in partnership with young people to help them express their voice, to have them be heard, to have them showcase their strengths, um, to work with them to become productive citizens. And I think the real program for me as an adult gives me an opportunity to learn from the young people that I'm working So quickly, quick, just by showing hands, how many here are, are pre-service teachers, are teach, future teachers, those who are going to be teachers? Okay, how many here are presently teachers now? Wow. How many are social workers, school counselors? Okay. How many here are mentors? Okay. So even though, the things that I'm going to be talking about today are specific to mentoring. Um, I would like for you to think of yourselves in some capacity, all of you as mentors, whether it's young folks that you work with at school, um, your own children, your coworker, possibly, someone sitting next to you. Um, we're all mentors in some capacity. We're all we pass down, share information so that it makes it easier for someone else. Uh, and I think that's the core, that's the core piece of mentoring. Um, so as the, as, the, as the video talked about, um, Real is Chicago-based, and it is focused on young folks. Um, and that is, that is, in many respects, the kind of the, the, the elevator speech to the program. And for, for us, as mentors, as young folks working in the city of Chicago, Real is a space for young folks not just to vent and talk about their needs, issues, and concerns, but also a space for them to feel empowered to make changes in their communities and in their own lives, which is critical, uh, particularly in this day and age. In the last 10 years, uh, 15 years actually that I've been doing the program, I have seen societal conditions um, get worse for young people. And so, and spaces shrink um, where they can be active and be uh, agents of change in their lives. So just a real personal history. I uh, taught for six years at Chicago Public Schools, fourth grade in special education. And kind of feeling a bit indifferent about the system and how young folks um, were kind of being pushed through, through, through the system of, 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 of schooling. Not necessarily education, but of schooling. Uh, there was this institutional aspect to it that I had problems with. Um, I will say this as an example. Uh, if I had a special education classroom, 13 students, no aid in the class, eight of those students were boys, African-American males, five were girls, but I'm going to say 10 of those students didn't belong in that classroom. There were three that I said, okay, we need some definite you know, services on this end of the spectrum. But for the other 10, remedial. So what happens, why is that? What is happening in that space? And it puzzled me. So I went to grad school to kind of figure that out, to look at some of the literature, which of course I could do at home, right? But it didn't hurt to get another degree, get a pay raise. Um, and my work focused on understanding the disproportionate numbers of black and brown students in special education. And do, are they ever really mainstreamed? Do they ever really grow out of that label of being cognitively delayed, behavior disorder, oppositional defiant disorder? How does that label stick with them? In the process of understanding that research question, one of my mentors at the university, a man by the name of William Schubert, approached me 
and he knew my work, uh, my research focus. And he says, there's a school in the city of Chicago that is having problems with their African American Latino males, high school, charter school. I said, okay. Um, I said, could you go in and talk to him? I was like, all right, sure. And I said yes because he was my mentor. I didn't want to let him down. But I had no idea what, what, what I was going to say to these folks. I mean, I read about it. I, I experienced it as a teacher, but I really didn't know how to help people. I wasn't in that position. So I put together some other graduate students, and we went to the school, and we sat with the directors of the school, some teachers, and we talked about what was happening um, at the school. And so there was low attendance and student, overall student apathy towards education. We don't want to go to school. We've heard it before. Students are disconnected. We went in, we listened, we said, okay, what you need is a mentoring program. Goodbye, see you later, that's it. I get a call a week later saying, okay, when are you gonna come in and start this mentoring program? <laughs> I was like, me? He's telling me, uh, hold on, let's put you on hold real quick. Um, so it starts snowballing, right? So I go in, here I am, the other, the other folks that I had coming on the initial meeting didn't come with me. They had, they had, busy, they had other things to do. But we, I connected with two parents um, at the school. And their sense was the same thing. These young men are not coming to school. They're apathetic. They're different. Um, they're disconnected. Um, they're on, they're, they dropped out. Not, they're in the building, but they've dropped out. Cognitively, mentally, they're just not there. So let's develop a program. So the three, so the three, the two parents and myself sat around and developed the program. And the original name of the program was respecting and educating African American and Latino males. And we called it Realm. It was called Realm, which sounds kind of scary. Like who wants to be part of Realm? So. The idea behind the program was going to be based on entrepreneurship. How to get students involved in developing a business because two of the parents were entrepreneurs. So I said, well, that sounds pretty good. I think, I think the guys, would, the fellows would like that. Um, and so after school, we had our first session. This is maybe in, I want to say, uh, January, February of 1999. And, um, the guys were, they didn't voluntarily come to the program. They were, I remember seeing students kind of being pushed into the room and asked to sit down and just sit down and be quiet, right? Um, so they didn't, they didn't really want to be there. The first two months of the program, attendance fluctuated. So we had like, first off, we started with 15 being forced in, five dropping off, another seven, coming and being there, five dropping off, and we ended like with two boys from the actual school. So then one of the parents had the idea, well, let's recruit students from another school, from a neighboring school, and have them come in and sit in front of the program. So I said, okay, what's the focus? Entrepreneurship. So their, their version of entrepreneurship was developing a car wash for the students to do in the summertime. And it was a complete and total failure, an epic failure. One of the students took a Brillo pad and was scrubbing the car. Instead of doing the tire, they scrubbed, the, scrubbed the, the paint on the car. Didn't know, just didn't know. So, we continue on the car wash. We make about, maybe about $400 on the car wash. We have a meeting about, you know, what we're gonna do with the money, we will go for an outing. A parent walks in and says, listen, I want, my, I want my share of the cash. This is my son that we want, he did the work in, we, we want our share. We're like, man, this is a kind of a, a community program. We're trying to, you know, take the kids on a trip, you know, go to Great America or something, Six Flags, whatever. Yeah, can we just have our cash so we can go? And so we had to pay her the money, which she felt was fair. The following session, we sat down with the young men and we asked them, what do you think about the program? And they were so disconnected from what they were doing. They felt like, the idea of real, of realm, was pushed onto them. That there's no, 
uh, entrepreneur washing cars. That's not what we do. That's not, that's not us. So the two parents eventually, I, I think they felt a little slighted and they dropped out of doing the program. So I went home that summer and thought about what would the program look like if it was completely student generated, student led, student oriented. I just show up and then they do all the creation. I came back that following year and they're like, oh God, Realm is back. <laughs> oh God, I gotta go to a Realm session. But I told the, the directors of the school, listen, I want the program in the middle of the school day. I don't want it after school. I want it in the middle of the school day so that whatever students are going through in that time, in, that, in, their, in their school day, it can be addressed in its immediacy. They don't have to wait till after school. If they're having problems with a peer or with an adult, it's happening right there. So they said, okay. The first couple of meetings, two or three students showed up. And they liked it. I said, what, they were like, what, what are you going to do? I said, whatever you want to do. What are you into? Well, I like hip hop. I like poetry. I like spoken word. I like to draw. OK, cool, cool. Let's do that. Let's, 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 let's create something. So word got around the school, and then more and more students started showing up. All males, all African American Latino males. During that maybe seventh, eighth session, Students were like, okay, we gotta change the name of this program. Realm isn't gonna make it. <laughs> and they said, you know, but what if we go to a school, like we take our show on the road, and there aren't any African Americans or Latinos in the building? So that's a good point. So what do you think it should be? So we, we, we tossed some words around, and respect, excellence, attitude, and leadership were the words that students came up with. And we rolled with it. And plus, they like the notion of real. Keep it real, be real, let's get real. Right? They like that. That next year, by the end of the third quarter, we had 30 students in the program, and 75% of those males were on the honor roll. And attending school. They wanted to be there. And half of our sessions were just them coming and venting. Talking about a teacher, talking about their out of school lives, talking about their parents, their girlfriends, um, the struggles that they were facing. And in that process, realizing that they weren't alone in their issues, that they were sharing it with someone else, and then that they could brainstorm together to problem solve it. And taking the time having the time, which is different from the classroom, obviously, but taking the time to understand what your identity is, what your needs, issues, and concerns are, and not me projecting my agenda, my values, onto you. That's a really different idea of mentoring in many respects. So let me go through this. Um, Mentoring programs, the structure, that's the organizational history, organizational structure. Um, so once again, school, real is school-based. And since 2000, we have extended into the community. We don't have a base in the community. We are, we are school-based, but we, we work with young folks in their communities, in their homes, uh, with their peers. Um, Community-based programs such as Big Brothers Big Sister, the Girls and Boys Club, the National Mentoring Partnership, those are programs that are community, they're community-based, but they also go into schools. Traditional versus non-traditional, and I kind of struck out the term hierarchy. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But traditional mentoring programs typically have a hierarchy, a hierarchy right? You have the mentor at the top, or the adult at the top, and the young person at the bottom. And all the information is passed down and poured into the head of the student. When I, I'm not concerned about what your, what your needs are. I just really just want to help you do it my way. Natural mentoring, real comprises natural mentoring in that the students who, in many respects, they don't want you, they don't want you to, they don't want to be, they don't want you to call them a mentee. 
and they don't want you to be a mentor because there's pejorative notions that come with that relationship, primarily because of the traditional hierarchical structure. So I don't want to, I, you're not a mentor, you're, you're, you're like my uncle, you're like a friend, right? They prefer the natural way of let's build together, let's form camaraderie together. And so we have students who approach the program who aren't in the program, but just want to connect with an adult who can provide access to honest information. One-on-one, um, -on -one, we do one-on-one -on -one group and peer mentoring, both within the school setting and in the community setting. Um, recruitment. Our mentors, which is, and this is, this is a problem in a lot of mentoring programs nationwide, worldwide, no matter how big they are, is recruitment. So recruitment, one, in getting uh, male, adult males and females into the program, and two, matching students or youth with adults. And so, because we have a group dynamic, my idea is to bring on as many mentors as possible so that students can pick and choose who they want to connect with. So in some instances, if we, when we have girls in the group, and we, pick, and we started adding girls after the success of the program in 2002, we had a female mentor part of the program, but the girls didn't want to talk to her. They didn't like her. So they would just talk to me. And they liked talking to me. Because they wanted a perspective of a male who didn't look like someone from their community. And, and, and I'll talk about the deficit model in a minute, but mentoring programs, more often than not, are seen as deficit model interventions. In other words, how many have heard of the deficit model? Good. In other words, we get the students who apparently aren't doing well in school, who are behavioral issues, who have academic problems. We don't get students who are doing well and are functioning um, on high levels. That's just what it is, unfortunately. So, special projects. The program, once again, to draw students in and to, and to and to speak to what their particular needs, issues, and concerns are, and abilities and talents, we do arts-based projects. Young folks love the arts. Even those who don't think they are artistic love being involved in creation. Um, so we do, that's poetry, spoken word, dance, song. Um, we have some young folks who are more intently and more recently into videography and photography and exposing young people to video. So the video that you saw um, initially at the outset was created by young people. They did the editing. They did the interviewing. And they're exposed to technology that they, that they really didn't know existed. Even though that's just, you know, that's old, um, some of these young people didn't know that that technology existed and they are, and they are intrigued by it and they want to know more about it. Um, and, so that's, and so that's a big thing for them. Um, and then finally, once again, I struck through catch and release. Has anyone heard of catch and release? What's catch and release? Right, right. So it's, it's a fishing term, right? You catch the fish, you reel it in, and sometimes, you know, they hold it up, take a picture, right? And they throw it back in, right? Mentory programs have been um, guilty of that. <laughs> Catching the, men the mentee, oh look, I'm saving the kid's life. Take a picture. Write a blog, check out my blogosphere. You know, we work with the Boys and Girls Club. And then they, and then they throw the student away. After that student has developed a relationship with them. And so going back to recruitment, when we talk about matching, sometimes mentors are matched with a particular mentee, and they, it's, not a, it's not a good match. But they've carried it on for so long, and, that's, and that young person didn't have anyone to talk to, and then they disconnect. Because it was, it's a bad match for the adult. And sometimes it's a bad match for the young person. So I know some catch and release is something that we try to avoid. And we've been working with, the students that you saw in the video, they're grown folks now. They're, they're in college, finishing college, and we still are communicating with them. 
The young men that I talked about who helped create the program back in 1999, 2000 are in their 30s and we still talk. When we look at mentoring, the literature on mentoring, you find that you have to stay in the life of a young person at least 12 months once a week in order to have an impact. At least 12 months. So in case you decide to you know, join, a, join a mentoring program, you gotta stick with it. You can't do the catch and release. That can cause more harm than never connecting with the child in the first place. So um, the continued context of the program, just to go specifically into the deficit model. And once again, I know some of you all, once I'm talking about mentoring specifically, but I also want you to translate it into your own practice. Intently. So, the deficit model offers a moralistic interpretation of the problem that locates the causes of social exclusion in the deficits of young people. So, in other words, why they drop out of school physically and mentally, why they behave in certain behaviors, disconnect, gangs, whatever, it's, it's because it's Something inside of them is a deficit. Something inside of them is broken. Something inside of them doesn't meet up to the values, the middle class values. Teaching is a primarily a middle class enterprise. So is mentoring. And we can work with folks who are not middle class, who are low income, or living in poverty, and we, as we, we translate when we bring our own values to their lives, and it doesn't match. And if, there, and if something is wrong with them, then we say, oh, it's, it's you, something, something is broken inside of you, or broken inside of your family, or broken inside of your community, without understanding larger social dynamics that are occurring in their lives, that impact their lives. And so these generalized, pathologized social groupings that we aggregate students into, we call them at risk. We call them high risk. We call them behavior disorders. We call them oppositional defiant disorders. We call them cognitively delayed. We call them disadvantaged, poor, free and reduced lunch, and, and those labels are real, right? But we know sometimes with disadvantage and free and reduced lunch, the poor folks, that the label that often accompanies financially being poor is morally being poor, intellectually being poor, and then we judge them. And that's part of the deficit. The deficit model also ignores the function of deep-seated structural factors such as race, class, and gender, and how that has a profound impact on the life chances of young people. So for example, young, black, male, poor, stereotype. Poor white female, pregnant, 17, stereotype. Black female, in a gang, stereotype. Without understanding what's happening in a larger structural societal sense, and how that impacts young people. So the color of my skin, the, the amount of money that I don't have in the bank, impacts my life chances. It also ignores unemployment, widespread unemployment, underemployment, um, and the collapse of the youth labor market. So what that means is, and some of the folks in this room might understand, there's some of the older, our elders in the room, 40, 50 years ago, if not more, you can leave high school and get a job making like 20, 30 bucks an hour in industry, pension, unionized, support a family, right? Those jobs don't exist anymore, or they're overseas. And so when you use your hands, and you use your backs to support your family, those jobs don't exist due to new technologies and globalization. And so the labor market has shifted, so you have jobs where you have young folks, 19, 20, competing with older folks, 30 and 40 for jobs. And jobs are scarce. What's the unemployment rate in South Carolina? 
4%, what is it? Anybody know? 6%? Somebody say 20%? Depends on the area, right? Bottom line, folks are struggling. Okay? And so these are factors that go into the lives of young people. You know, one of the high schools that I, that I teach at in Inglewood, I have, I work with students, and I'll show a video later who can't read. They're 17, 18, can't read. And we've seen that before. But they're working three or four jobs because the parents aren't working. Or they're helping to pay the cell phone bill, the gas bill, the light bill. Those are larger structural dynamics that we have to take into account. That isn't about the individual per se, but it's about society. And if we don't understand that, then we're gonna judge people. It's like, oh, you don't, you don't, you got three jobs. Oh, you just don't wanna to come to school, do you? You just don't wanna work. That's problematic. And so when we understand that, when we take that into account, then we can change our scope and our vision of how young people work in this society. I was telling the first morning session um, that young people, youth in this country, have no substantive educational rights. That they can have their education denied. In the city of Chicago, some of you heard about this, they closed 50 public schools. Staggering, 50 public schools. And these are 95% African-American schools and in dangerous communities. So those, those children already had to traverse um, very violent gang lines just across the street. You close the school, now they have to traverse a mile or two to get to school. Denied access to free and appropriate education. These are large societal systemic issues that have to be discussed. So the real program avoids, opposes this kind of adultist deficit model, unilateral paradigm that we see in Mitchell. And similarly, as we see in the classroom. So the unilateral paradigm, you have the adults to telling the, youth, the young person, this is what you need to do. I know your issues, I know, I know what the problem is. Just listen to me. Yeah, you want to tell me how you feel, that's cool, but let me tell you how it's done in this world. It doesn't matter what your needs, issues, concerns are, I can tell you how it's done. Right? And so the flow of it is one way, it's, it's, it's unilateral. And so we don't take the time to understand young people. In real, we choose the empowerment paradigm, which is the opposite. And as you can see with the arrows, it shows the flow of information, knowledge, and experiences is shared between adults and between youth. So um, the arrows going crisscross, the adults and the, and the, and the youth and the youth are connecting with each other, peer mentoring. Adults are learning about each other and learning about the youth and exchanging information. You have youth connecting with adults and, the youth and, and adults connecting with youth, quite simply. So, more specifically, the, the youth empowerment paradigm speaks to meeting young folks where they are. And that speaks to developmentally where they are. So what are their issues physically? Are they going through puberty? Is there this, is this disequilibrium happening at the time? Is this inwardization? I don't want to be bothered. Leave me alone. I know what's best. I'm going to get with my, I'm going to get with my clique. I'm going to get with my crew. You know, we're going to work it out, right? Um, where are they at socially, emotionally? What are they thinking? Do we understand these things? You know, the thing about schools is that traditionally, they ask students, implicitly ask them, to leave their needs, issues, concerns at the threshold of the door. We're concerned with academic intellectual capacities in this space. We have a school counselor to work that out, if we have some issues. But that's impossible for young people to make that disconnection. They have to bring in their needs, issues, concerns. It plays out in the classroom, and it plays out in curriculum. 
And so you can have the, the slickest, shiniest lesson plan in the world. If students don't connect with you, they don't understand what your issues are, then that curriculum, that lesson plan can really just go in the garbage. We have to understand these issues. And we have to take the time to work with young people to do that. Recognizing the unique voices and identity. So essentially, having young folks moving past the social groupings, moving past the stereotypes, moving past you're, just, you're simply cognitively delayed, you're simply at risk. Once you label a child at risk, I mean, it's like that's it in many respects. Once you label them high risk, it's like, oh my God. You, once you label a child high risk, in your mind, there's this long list of, 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 of attributes that go with it. And you stop seeing the multidimensionality of that child. So having young folks suffer interpret their own needs, issues, and concerns, which is an adult skill. Having young people figure out how they interpret the best way to problem solve their reality, with your assistance, of course, but how do they interpret it? How do they see it? I mean, in some respects, we don't know the cultural context of where they live, of their household. So how do they voice it? How do they articulate what they're going through? Does that make sense? And then agency and self-determination. So a big part of the program um, is having young people Motivate, activate. Understand that if there's going to be any, any change in their communities, then it really does take them to do it. I mean, for the most part, if you are 40 and over in this room, right, we have to look to young folks to make a change in this country, in this world. That's the way it's always been. Young people change the world. This is their generation, this is their time. Why not engage them in understanding how do I be agentic? Some of the circumstances in which they live can be so disempowered. The school system, the school, the classroom itself can be disempowered. How do I get students to be more self-determined? Changing their lives. Um, so in the program, we have three essential strands. And this is how, we, this is how it's done in getting young folks to be self-determined and agentic. One is self-expression. Self-expression is vocalizing previously repressed issues and emotions in the classroom. So creating that in-school space where young folks can come together 20 or so young folks come together, boys and girls, and talk about their issues, which is critical, because they can't do it typically in the classroom. And we're finding that some people, some young folks in our communities in Chicago are going to parks, are going to their backyards, and they're talking to each other about their issues, and they're not doing it constructively. They're using violence to address their issues. Critical dialogue. So, now that folks have kind of sat around and talked, they've had this, um, this catharsis, right? How do you understand the large social dynamics play a part in what's, what, what is happening in your life? That it's not just about you. That it's not personal. That it's not individual. That you are impacted by larger social dynamics. And so questioning unequal power relations. I'm poor, there's rich folks, why is that? I'm in the school, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a child, teacher's talking down to me, what is that? Um, and then thinking about how do I change that situation? How does that work? How do I change myself? How am I complicit in my own oppression? We find that young folks typically want to blame someone for their issues, for their problems. Very rarely do they blame themselves, particularly adolescents. Um, my son, who's, even, who's nine, is always saying, Daddy, look what you made me do. I'm like, I'm all the way over here. What are you talking about? 
about. I'm always telling them, be accountable for your own actions. Understand how you are a part of that. I mean, you can only blame me because I, I helped bring you into this world. That's about it. But other than that, you're the one that dropped the glass. Right? So helping young folks understand that you are complicit in meaning respects in your actions, in your circumstances. Sometimes it's not necessarily the circumstances, but the decisions that you make in those circumstances, right? And then youth activism, which is critical because sometimes just talking about the issues and pointing them out uh, can be depressing. It's like, oh my God, like really, okay, the world's coming to an end. I'm just gonna get into a box, bless you. Uh, that's it. Um, well, I'm not, what can I do? I'm just one person. What, what can I change? And so have, have you done, informing young folks that you have the ability to galvanize, you have the, you have the ability to organize and change your life. And that is, that is that's something that doesn't come readily to young people. Because I think the generation today is very much unaware of how to organize, and if there's any hope in that organization. Can anything come out of it? So there's this, there is this sentiment of indifference, of apathy, that nothing's gonna change. People talk about it, but nothing really changes. Um, and so this next video that I wanna show you looks at the work of some students who, just to kind of give you context, in 2009, Mayor Daly, the mayor of the city of Chicago at the time, put forth a bid to have the Summer Olympics in Chicago 2016 Summer Olympics. In that process, in, in, in the need to get the bid for the Summer Olympics in Chicago, they started in Bronzeville, a community called Bronzeville, they shut down uh, that area's major hospital, they closed schools, and then they started closing, they started um, upping the, the property taxes in the area. So people who were living there had to leave. And they're also asking residents to sell their homes. They started um, tearing down the housing projects in the area, so people were being pushed out, they were being uprooted. And so the citizens in the community were like, what is going on? So we were doing real in a school called Phillips uh, High School, and the Chicago Police Department has a headquarters in the, in the high school. That's how bad the high school is. They had their own office. Um, I don't think they have these cells in the building, but um, just cops walking around with, with, with pistols and handcuffs and the squad cars, and, and that's typical for a lot of Chicago public schools. So we go in, and we're talking to the young men and women about what's happening in the school. Da -da -da. Some of the young men are talking about how. You know, the same police officers that patrol the school are the same police officers that patrol the community. And so they know each other. And it's, and it's not good. The, that relationship is not a good relationship between this police officer and, this, and, 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 these, and, these, and these teenagers. Um, security is, 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 is increased. There's increased dropout in the school which kind of reflects this, the increased uprooting of the area. So students are not only dropping out, but they're also leaving the community. Um, and so we said, well, what do you all want to do about it? So let's, let's, let's protest. Let's change our condition. Let's let people know that this is, because there's people who don't know about it. So let's let people know. I said, well, who do you want to include? And so their first thought was just to include students in the school. But then they said, well, wait a minute, let's organize with, with, with community elders and community professionals. And then let's create some, a letter and some video to send to the mayor to let them know that we won't stand for this. And so this video uh, is conducted by them, created by them, um, and it's part one of their efforts.
and the things that I do, the things that I used to do, I'm not even, you know, doing anymore. Because I feel like it's time for me to get bigger and better, and I just don't want to be seen as one of these dudes out here on the street or nothing like that, doing the same thing from 10 years later. You know what I'm saying? Because most of the people that's out here doing what they're doing, 10 years later, you're going to see them in the future, and they still going to be in the same spot right there on 39th. When you rebuild all of this, you know, what's the chance of us getting back what we have now? <laughs> I kind of look at it as uh, basically slim to none because it's too expensive. I mean, I mean, let's just be realistic. All the suburb, suburban homes that are out there in the suburbs basically cost about the same price as what they're about to build out here right now. So. The buildings that are going to be here in the city, this landfill is not going to be here no more. This ain't going to be the wells no more. This is going to be all wood shores. The possibility of us coming back would be less likely because they're going to make the suburbs a lot cheaper and the homes that are in the city are a lot higher. And then that just comes with them balancing options. You're going to have to choose where you're going to have to live. Gentrification. Well, basically, I'm from 21st and State Street, uh, Hilliard Homes. Uh, someone else out there, um, catch the rest of the YouTube. Um, are there any questions about that video? Any thoughts about that? Is that, does that, is that resonating with anyone in this room? What's happening there? Did it work? I'm sorry? Did it work? So, this is the deal. We didn't get to bed. Obviously, right? For the, the Summer Olympics. We sent the video in, we went down to City Hall, protested, and because we didn't get the bid, we were dismissed, right? Because that was our issue, right? Oh, because it's the Olympics that are coming, so that's the reason why we're upset and you're changing the community. But because we didn't get the bid, they thought, like, well, what's the problem now? But they still haven't stopped gentrifying the area. That school that those young men went to. Was, was, turned into a, was turned into a small school. You've heard of small schools where they gut out the original school that was there, the original public school that was there, and put in a number of different small schools. And so, uh, charter schools. And so those young men, some of, some of them stayed, uh, some of them graduated, but some of them were uprooted out of the community. Yes? Right, so, so, you know, schools are a small representation of society, right? We can agree on that, right? So whatever, whatever's happening in schools is happening in communities. <laughs> and has anyone heard of Darian Albert? Is there a man called Darian Albert? No. Um, it made national, it made global news about three years ago. The young man went to a high school in Rosen in Chicago. And he was leaving school, and there was um, a fight going on outside the school. And we're talking about 30, 40 students in the street swinging fists, swinging two by fours at each other. And Darian Albert was struck with a two by four uh, and died. So when you just watch it on face value, you're seeing students who are just fighting each other. When you dig a little deeper, you found out that those students were from two different communities. One was from the, one was from the Rosen community, and the other were from the Robert Taylor homes in the Bronzeville community that had been shut down. And so the tension started inside the school. You're not from around here. I don't see you. I never, you know, I don't know you. Right? We're competing for um, limited resources already. And so there's tension between students. And teachers recognize that tension, and they get out of it, they get out of the way. But then most of the violence that occurs, uh, even though we have security cameras and cops in schools, most of the violence that occurs in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, is in the streets. And so you have community members who aren't from the same area fighting with each other, gangs increasing, because they're from different areas. Does that answer your question?
Could be. When we have gentrification downtown, what you're seeing in the surrounding areas is that these students are now moved out to the suburb schools and um, that may not be used to serving students who have like, a different cultural background um, because place does determine culture and it's beyond color. It, it really is class and SDS and things like that. And so I'm wondering, what have you guys seen happening in schools and how are teachers and administrators being prepared to handle this cultural shift? Well, it's not just students who are dropping out. A student, a teachers are dropping out. Everybody leaves. It's, it's, it's the same thing that happens in, commu in, in communities. When the unpreferred population moves in, those who are already there leave. It happens in schools. When the unpreferred population comes in, teachers, principals leave, and sometimes they're just fired. <laughs> they're blamed, right, because the students aren't doing what they're supposed to do, so teachers and principals are blamed. So there's a community in Illinois called uh, Hazelcrest. And Hazelcrest traditionally um, started off a uh, white community, middle income, has progressed to become African American, right? But the difference is, is that the influx of families who are coming from the city because of the gentrification that's happening there is creating a different kind of community. These are low income students coming into a middle income community. They call me up, the principal of one of the high schools there calls me up, called Hillcrest High School, calls me up. It says when our students are being suspended because there's a, there's a teacher student dissonance, increased teacher student dissonance, like I don't understand. Not only do I not understand you culturally, in terms of uh, in terms of ethnic, right? I don't understand where you're from geographically. So we're in the suburban area. I don't understand. I don't understand that that urban language that you're talking about and that urban hustle you got going on. And that urban swag you're doing, I don't, what is that? When our students are suspended, they break into homes. When I was suspended, I would go home and play with my, you know, video games. That's what most kids do. Go play basketball. These young folks break into homes. Because that's part of how they are engaging the environment that they're living in. Teachers are disconnecting because there's a community in a suburban community in Chicago called Naperville. I'm in mean, Naperville. Upper income community, right? Upper income schools. Here comes Radio Raheem into the community, into the school, and it creates the community, it creates havoc. The community is culture shock, but so is Raheem. He doesn't understand what's, where am I? So he's dealing with this psychological first aid as well. In our institutes of higher education, <coughs> my classes are 85%, which, is, which makes up public elementary schools, 85% white middle class female. The rest are, um, um, the rest primarily are women, but uh, African American and Latina. Primarily. I ask them invariably every quarter, where do you want to teach? You want to teach in Chicago Public Schools? Oh, no, no, no. Stay away from Chicago Public School system. Oh, don't do that, don't go there. You know, I'll switch jobs before I teach there. So where do you want to teach? I'm gonna teach where I where I was where I went to high school. But your high school is now 50% black now. And and kids from the city. You still want to go back there? Well, <laughs> you know, I might not be so bad. I won't be bad at CPS, right? But our teachers, our future teachers, aren't getting the knowledge, the cultural foundation, the cultural competency to deal with these changing times. I'm going to dominate the discussion.
session, but I guess I'm just drawing parallels to South Carolina in my mind. Like, um, what we, I guess what we see here is we have a lot of rural areas, and so you have individuals who don't want to go out, to example, for like a, a Williamsburg County or a Clarendon County, and it's not just because the students don't have needs, it's like the community itself may not be able to afford certain, I guess, lifestyle opportunities for our teachers. And so when you're preparing people to teach kids, and, and we're saying, you know, as a state that we have all these different types of communities that need teachers, I'm really wondering how do we, how do we make a, a school that's going to be diverse because the rural communities are going to have like immigrant students too. You get what I'm saying? So that's that's a different culture coming in. You're going to have students who may not have like the opportunities to be exposed um, that you would have in a more urban area. South Carolina has very few urban areas. So how, how do we prepare our teachers to be able to meet the unique needs of all of these different types of students? Because the other side of that is that there's an accountability issue now because all students need to be meeting you know, certain types of assessment levels and things like that. So I'm just wondering when you're, when you're seeing that, what's being done in the urban, because some of the parallels can be drawn between urban and rural needs. Um, so that's a huge question and it has so many different layers to it. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the core of teacher education itself, right? So I'll, I'll answer it this way. One, what is the mission of the teacher, the college of education? What is the mission of that teacher college? Is it to go into those spaces and engage those young folks? Or is your, is your teaching faculty culturally competent, right? And, and, and not just in terms of race, right, but also in terms of class. And, I, and, I, and I, don't want to, I don't mean to get into the whole mantra of race, class, and gender, but that's real. And in that preparation, are you preparing, are you preparing future educators to want to go into that space and be there? Is there like, um, a residency in that space? Um, is the state providing monies for, for teachers to go in there and, make, and be a, 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 a change maker? Is there a sense of social justice in the space that you're working in? Is that a part of the curriculum? So when we look at the, the history of teacher education, very rarely is it about understanding community dynamics. It, it's, it's, I mean, you, you have some colleges and universities now understanding that. But for the most part, it's about how to teach. The three R's plus technology. Schools historically and presently exist in a vacuum. When we ask parents to get involved, it's not in terms of getting involved in terms of what's going on in the community, but what's going on in the school. So it's not, it's, it's parent, it's not parent engagement, it's just parent involvement. There's a difference. So schools don't necessarily prepare future teachers to engage the community, but for the community to engage schools. And, that's, and, and those are two fundamentally different things. Two fundamentally different things. Do you understand what's happening in the setting that you're in? In CPS, and this is nationwide, incidentally, you have about 10% of all teachers, future teachers, when they graduate, never go into the field. 30 plus percent who leave after their first year. Why? Because when they walked in the door, they're like, oh my God, who, what are we doing up there? They want, they, you know what I'm saying? And so now when we look at community dynamics shifting, Oh my God, so I want to go back to the school that I, that I was taught in, and it looks completely different. These aren't the kids I grew up with, so now what do I, now where do I go? And as you heard the young man say in the video, you must go back to the city and teach, because that's changing. Right, so I mean, to me it begins with, it begins with policy. 
right? Let's not get it twisted. That's where it begins. Everything else is underneath that. The policies impact mindsets. And then when we look at teacher education, then we get into the institution itself and say, well, who's teaching our future teachers? What are they saying to them? Are they trying to appease them so that they get that, that, that really good rating on professor, rate my professor? Dot com, oh God, again, my, my evals are so important, right? Are we being real with future educators? Not shedding them from the reality that exists out there. You know, I work primarily with black and brown students, but they're low income. They're poor. But they have hopes and dreams and aspirations, and at the core of what they want is opportunity is access. And so when, 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 if future teachers don't understand that very simple concept, then what are, they, what are they going in and promoting? They're going in and promoting catch and release. Hey, I'm here. Um, I'm here to teach you, and then, they, and then that teacher's gone. I mean, the message, that the symbolism of that, the metaphor of that is intense. Particularly in the lives of students who a lot of adults do a lot of catch and release, if they even do the catching in the first place. I had a veteran from school in Chicago up to 10 years ago. For 20 years. And the most challenging, uh, the fact is I had five different gangs. I hired teachers from the Chicago area, experienced teachers. And I, as I recall, on a number of occasions, many of them worked only about a month. They couldn't handle it. I had to hand-picked, select, and specially train persons to work with these kids. Many of them um, left the Chicago public school system. In fact, one young man chased the principal with, with a baseball bat. And I got a call from Mayor Bailey's office and asked uh, if I would take the person to school, which we did. But the fact is, every teacher cannot do it. Regrettably, our educational institutions do not prepare teachers to deal with this type of population because they're not cha are trained to be change agents. Somalia doesn't even, I mean, just formed a government last year. We've been 
been around forever. 1781, y'all. So you know, the work that we the work that we're doing in the in the in the real program is about young people in many respects advocating for themselves. How do they advocate for themselves so they don't constructively, so they don't find destructive spaces to voice, or they don't voice destructively? How do they influence community? How do they influence the policies of schools? How do they influence the policies of the city? I mean, I think we're really past the point in many respects where we just kind of sit back and watch it happen. I, I, I really do. I mean, we are past that point. And we are past the point of, this is somebody else's child, not mine. We are so past that. Yes? Yes, we do. I think, and I think, that, I think in many respects that goes without saying. But what makes it difficult to do that is when we're, like we're in this era, I think the pendulum has shifted in education towards extreme standardization of not just students, but also teachers so, and principals. And so it's difficult. I mean, we don't have the luxury of time to do that. We can create that, but we're not given that time to do that. We, some, of those, some of the young folks that I work with, and this is, once again, this is understanding the larger social dynamics, have not been off the block in their communities. Didn't know that Lake Michigan was a lake. <laughs> Thought it was the ocean. Had never been downtown. Really quick, one student, we were going down and we were doing a Discover Chicago program. We went downtown. We were gonna go into Macy's department store. The young lady said, no, I can't go in the Macy's department store. I said, why not? What happened? She said, nothing. My mama said I couldn't go in there. I said, why? She said, because we don't belong in there. This is 2013 that she said this. This wasn't like, you know, 1958. This is 2013. We don't belong in there. So it's intergenerational in many respects. It's economic why we don't get off the block, but it's also time to understand diversity. And, and as future educators, how diverse are we in our thinking? Do we bring a diversity of thought to the space that we're in? Do we understand the importance of, yes, it's important for these young folks to, to mix, to mingle, to understand one another, but in that process, do we have time to do that? And that's the key piece. So how do we create time? And so it's important to program us. Yes. All right. So listening to young people in a respectful way, understanding their language, not judging them by these at-risk, um, high-risk social groupings, low income, poor, impoverished, rural, right? Because when we do that, believe it or not, there's this list of, of schema, pictures, words that follow that, that come with that. That's problematic, right? Two, understanding where young folks are. And more importantly, understanding where young folks and their families are, socially, emotionally, intellectually, cognitively, what are they going through? What are their needs, issues, and concerns? So how do we do that? 
right? It starts with your classroom. It starts with talking with young people, creating the time. Now, I look, sometimes I look at it like this, and this is what I had to do when I taught. If I know that I might leave anyway, or I might be fired, what do I have to lose? Because it sure beats catch and release, right? What do I have to lose? Nothing. And then finally, agency and self-determination. Those are things that we aspire to as adults. How, do, how am I independent? Being independent enough to make a change in my own life personally, but now even more so community on a community level. How do I make that change? And that change begins with the individual. So we have to bring that. We have to try as hard as we can to bring that to our classrooms. I have to stop. Time is of the, is of the essence. But thank you. Come to the workshop next. I continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, we have we've been enlightened. We've learned. And please, uh, if you want further conversation, Horace is going to be here after the 15 minute break. If you will um, kind of. Uh, be sure to fill out the exit forms when you before you leave this afternoon on your evaluation form. Another hand for Horace, please.